Joining us now at our table is James Zogby, who's the founder and president of the Arab, Arab American Institute, to talk about Muslim Americans and this ISIS strategy. I want to begin, though, before we get to that discussion, sort of with your group, the Arab American Institute. Right. Who do you represent? Well, we represent the Arab American community, which is about three and a half to four million um, descendants of uh, immigrants uh, and recent immigrants, going back actually over a century, uh, being in this country. Um, about two thirds or a little more of the Arab community are Christian, uh, about a third are Muslim. Um, and, um, and our work covers a range of issues from political empowerment to domestic civil liberties issues um, and promoting better understanding of the community um, and dealing with problems of backlash like the ones we've uh, experienced after 9-11 and, and more recently um, in, the, in the current environment. But we also do a lot of foreign policy uh, work and issues involving uh, American policy in the Middle East are of great concern to us and I've been a guest on C-SPAN talking about many of them. So there are less Muslim uh, uh, Arab Americans in this country yeah. than Christians. Yes, yes, and um, er, there's a sense in the general public when we do our polling on this to just get a sense of the lay of the land. Um, uh, Americans think to conflate Arab and Muslim. Um, all Arab Americans are Muslim, all Muslim Americans are Arabs. That's simply not the case. The largest component group of Muslim Americans are, are African American. Um, Muslims, uh, and, and after that are probably South Asian, um, with Arabs being uh, down the line. And, and among Arab Americans, uh, the majority are Christian, but, uh, but maybe, like I said, a little more than two-thirds, and then, and then Muslim Americans. But within the community, there's not a sense of, I'm this, you're that. It's a question of the Arab ethnicity, and sometimes the country of origin ethnicity. You know, the uh, Syrian American or Palestinian American or Egyptian American, that kind of that kind of thing. Where do the Christian Arab Americans have come from traditionally? M m well, most Arab Americans, Christian and Muslim, come from Lebanon. Um, that, that is the, the the place where folks came from, and you know, immigration is like an avalanche. Um, at one rock hits uh, as the rocks are tumbling down and everything piles up behind it. And so we have concentrations. People would have come from a village in Lebanon, settled in a community, and they say, this is a great place to live, and everybody flocks over to that place. Um, a lot of Arab immigrants uh, went to South America. So many went to Africa. Um, but, but America, the, the U.S., uh, became the, the home of mostly Lebanese and then Syrian immigrants uh, at the, the turn of the century through World War I, the end of World War I. And then after immigration got frozen then for about 30, 30 years, after it, it eased up uh, and we, the, the, the sort of the, the block on Arab immigrants ended, um, there was a much more diverse component. So today there's a large number of Egyptian Americans and, and Iraqi Americans and now Yemeni Americans um, and of course, Syrian Americans, uh, and with the lottery, North Africans. So you have Moroccans, Tunisians, and Algerians coming in, also in fairly large numbers. And interesting, uh, the, this, the community is a success story. In, in all of the census data that we have, income is higher than the national average, education higher than the national average, ownership of business higher than the national average. The community's done quite well. And, and some, the recent immigrants, like the Yemenis, for example, in a very short period of time, went from farm workers in California or dock workers in New York uh, to business owners and now in, the, in their children are in the professional class, doctors, lawyers, engineers, et cetera. It's, it's quite a wonderful community uh, to get to know. So Syrian refugees who right. are fleeing the situation in their country now, do many of them, or those that are seeking refugee status in the United States, yeah. have that family tie here. Many of them do. Uh, or they have a village tie, or they have some kind of connection with a church or with a mosque uh, community that, is, uh, that is, is familiar with them or with their background. And so um, uh, the scare about this is, is really unfortunate, and I think in, in many ways quite destructive. Um, uh, there's a large Syrian American community that they would embrace uh, refugees who came. And I will tell you that within short order, the community of refugees who come now will be uh, productive members of American society. That's been the experience of my community all along the way. I remember Dearborn, Michigan, 30 years ago when you had a whole 
group of people coming from South Lebanon when Israel occupied South Lebanon. Um, and the guy who ran for mayor back then said, it's the problem of Dearborn. They, they're dirty, they're this, they're that, they don't speak our language, etc. Today the president of the city council of Dearborn is an Arab American. Four of the seven members of the city council are Arab American. Arab Americans own most of the businesses that you see in the, in the community and are now buying property to revitalize Detroit. They've become a success story uh, in, in just three decades. That's the way Arab American immigrants, refugees and immigrants uh, have operated in this country. By the way, this morning we've divided the lines, you know, Republicans, Democrats, Independents, as we usually do. But we do have a fourth line this morning from Muslim Americans. If you want to call in, like to hear your story, 202-748-8003 and get your thoughts on just this whole debate uh, about Islam and Muslim Americans. I want to show you, Mr. Zogby, this poll from the Washington Post, ABC. Sure. A majority of Republicans back a Muslim ban proposed by yeah. Donald Trump. Yeah. We did a poll, too. We're coming out with it later this week. and The numbers are frightening. Um, uh, in some ways, uh, attitudes towards Muslims are like attitudes towards gay marriage um, about a decade and a half ago. You have a, a red state, blue state, a Democrat-Republican divide that is very deep. They're mirror reflections of each other. Uh, Democrats being far more open uh, and inclusive. Republicans, um, I think, reflecting a much more nativist and xenophobic uh, um, attitude on, on a whole range of issues affecting Muslims. You said there are more Christian Arab Americans yeah. than Muslim Arab Americans in this country. Yeah. How many, though, Arab Americans voters are there in this country? And uh, do, will this make, will this energize that that populace to get out and vote? Y yes. Uh, the, 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 the simple answer is yes. It's, it's a couple million registered voters concentrated in states that are swing states, uh, concentrated in uh, states like Michigan and uh, Ohio, uh, where I just was yesterday, and Pennsylvania, um, and, uh, and increasingly in Florida. And the numbers do end up making a difference. And it's interesting because whether Arab American, Christian, or Muslim, when they hear this rhetoric, um, they wax indignant uh, because they know what xenophobia means. They know what intolerance towards Arabs and Muslims mean. And so even if I'm an Arab American Christian and I'm hearing politicians talk that way, it scares me and turns me off. And what's happened is that the community, which was divided, um, almost an even split, edging Democratic toward in the 90s, um, during the first decade of this, uh, this millennium, completely began to flip and so our polling numbers now um, and our voter registration numbers now are more like Hispanic uh, numbers than they are like other ethnic groups. We used to be like Italians and Irish sort of 39 uh, percent Democratic, uh, 34, 5 percent Republican. Today you get 45, 47 percent Democratic, 22 percent Republican and what it is is it's the domestic agenda uh, that was put forward by Republicans that scared people away. Everything from the, uh, the Park 51 uh, uh, controversy when the, the mosque being put up in, in, um, uh, in south, southern Manhattan um, or the civil liberties issues or the profiling agenda of uh, John Ashcroft and, uh, and Michael McKenzie when they were attorney generals in the Bush administration, that thing turned people off. And they said, these guys frighten us. And, uh, and the rhetoric as we got into the 2008 and 10 and 12 uh, campaigns, national and, uh, and presidential, uh, scared people even more. And so right now you have Christian and Muslim edging toward uh, the Democratic Party, and it's the result of the rhetoric that's done it, and this is only going to make it worse. We're going to get to your poll that sure. you're putting out later sure. this week, but first let's get to some calls. Sure. Bob is in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, a Democrat. You're on the air. Go ahead. Good morning, Mr. Segby. Hi. I have a question. Do you ever hear of cooperation from the sea? Cooperation? From the sea. And what do you mean, Bob? It was United States and Russia. 94 to 98, used drills up in uh, Vladivostok, Russia, and down in Hawaii. Our Marines went into Vladivostok and helped the Russians. And the Russians came down into Hawaii, and it went on for four years. I do not but know that, that, that period of history. That, uh, I'll look it up. Bob, what's your point of bringing it up? Well... 
how many Arab nations have got hit with those earthquakes. And if we had those drills continued, we could have saved a lot of Muslim lives. Well, let me tell you, there's been a lot of cooperation on issues of, of this sort. I know, for example, the United Arab Emirates um, went into Kosovo uh, with uh, medical uh, supplies, et cetera. They supported our, uh, our, our efforts there. Uh, a lot of work went into earthquakes in Pakistan. Uh, a lot of help going to uh, countries in Africa. Um, I remember speaking with President Jimmy Carter at one point telling me that uh, the, the diseases that he helped cure, that, he, that are attributed to his work in Africa, were possible because of the financial support he got from, uh, um, from Arab leaders. Sheikh Zayed in the UAE, for example, uh, extraordinarily generous in, in that way. And so I, I think there are levels of cooperation that we don't know about. Uh, we talk about the, the problems when they occur involving America and the Middle East. We don't talk about the ways that countries in the Middle East and America cooperate, the Jordanians, uh, the Egyptians, Saudis, uh, et cetera. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that goes on that doesn't make headlines because it's, uh, it's not sexy. Uh, violence is and uh, cooperation isn't. What about the dealing with the ideology of Islam um, uh, that ISIS has taken, sure. and specifically the radical yeah. Islam, yeah. Uh, and what leaders can do? Because H. Robert on Twitter wants to know from you, or he asks yeah. this, where's the condemnation of ISIS from Mr. Zogby, not hearing it? <laughs> he didn't hear it because he didn't ask. Of course I condemn it. And the issue, there's a line in the New Testament about those who have ears to hear and eyes to see. Um, the fact is, we condemn it all the time, obviously we do, because it's a horrendous uh, movement um, and, uh, and has done more horrible things to Arabs uh, than it has to anyone else. Uh, uh, the Christians in the Middle East are, are, are being uh, removed from their ancestral homes. Uh, other minorities, Sunni Muslims who don't adhere to the, the ideology of ISIS are, are being tormented and persecuted and killed. Um, of course we condemn it. Uh, the fact is, is that that's not the issue. The issue is what are we doing uh, about stopping it? Um, and what you have in the Arab world is a real growing consensus, a poll we did just recently in the Arab world, uh, overwhelming majorities denouncing the movement and looking for ways to deal with it, saying that we have to end corruption and, and non-representative governments. We have to uh, deal with these uh, extremist preachers who are doing it. And we have to deal with the social problems in the countries where ISIS grows. Um, it's growing in, in Iraq because Sunni Muslims feel excluded from governance. It's growing in Syria because the regime has not made a place for Sunnis and um, and because uh, the, 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 the cancer spread back from Iraq into, into Syria, and you have extremists coming from Europe. I mean, there's two migration flows going on in the world today. One is from Syria and Iraq to Europe, and the other is from uh, alienated young Muslims uh, from Europe flooding into Syria. We have to ask the question, and Europeans have to ask the question, why? Why are these kids who are living in, in the slums of Paris for three decades, um, why are they so alienated from French society that they're going to join this suicide cult in, in Syria? That's the issue that people have to look at and then try to come up with answers for. And that brings up this headline USA Today that Muslim families, moderate yeah. Muslim families in the United States are vital in the anti-terror fight, especially as they show a picture here of a, of a, of a, of a mother raising a young teenage yeah. boy. Yeah, Look, the, the, uh, here's the issue. Um, Certainly they are. The problem is not as grave a problem in America as it is in Europe. Um, there may be a hundred or so um, young people here uh, who have actually joined or tried to join, more likely tried to join and were blocked from joining. Uh, the problem is a, is a bigger issue in Europe, in Belgium, in France um, in, in particular, um, where thousands have gone to join ISIS. And the reason is because they are alienated from their own society. They are not alienated from American society. The problem of what Donald Trump at company are doing is they may, if they are successful, end up creating the very conditions off which ISIS breeds. Uh, if, if Donald Trump's idea that America should be hostile to Muslims takes hold 
and the movement grows, you'll get a generation of young Muslims growing up saying, you don't want us? Well, here's what you get. And that, that's, the, that's the, I think, the, the scary part of all of this. We have to have a very different mindset of how we include, incorporate, absorb, and welcome people into our culture. Walter is in Bridgetown, New Jersey, and independent. You're next, Walter. Thanks for hanging on the line. How are you doing, Mr. Zagby? You, you partly, uh, you partly uh, announced it, and my question for you was, uh, how can you convince someone like uh, Donald Trump how dangerous what he's doing is? Well, I, look, you know, I, I, I can't get inside Donald Trump's head. I, I, I wonder sometimes what happened here. Did this just grow? Is his narcissism so great that once he heard the crowds cheering, he just sort of kept going with it? Um, but look, he's destroyed the Trump brand. I mean, uh, people across the Middle East uh, who were doing business with him are now not doing business with him. Uh, I'll be damned if I ever go to a Trump hotel. Uh, uh, and I think a lot of Americans feel the same way. I mean, the demographic that he's appealing to may work at a point where they want to get into a mob rally situation. It may even turn out votes. But it's really a bad business decision on his part, and I think he's going to end up paying for it. Um, how you convince him? Probably uh, at the pocketbook. <laughs> I mean, I can't think any other way. Um, and, and I think he's got to get, you know, at the end, electorally beaten really badly. And I think Republican leaders have to do what former um, Labor Secretary Brock did the other day, which is a very strong denunciation. The more uh, that he is isolated, the more he is defeated, and the more his businesses suffer um, will bring him, uh, I think, uh, bring him down and maybe bring him to some, some sense of, uh, of, 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 of reality here. Well, we probably will hear from the Republican candidates tonight trying to differentiate themselves from Donald Trump. I, I hope so. Don, I want to hear, I want to have you re react to Donald Trump on CNN's State of the Union sure. on Sunday. At the same time, I have many friends that are Muslims, and I will tell you, they are so happy that I did this because they know they have a problem. There is a problem. Your Muslim friends Radicalized. are happy? Are happy I have many friends and at the highest level, and they're great. I have partners that are Muslim. I have unbelievable they relationships. They support a ban on Muslims entering they the U.S. They said, no, they said it's about time that somebody spoke up as to radicalism. You have radicalism in this country. It's here and it's trying to come through. I just read where ISIS has gotten a hold of a passport printing machine for the migrants to get them into the United States. Now, maybe that's true, maybe it's not. It's an early report. But how crazy are we allowing ourselves to be subject to this kind of terror? I don't think anyone doubts that, that radical Islam is, is a big problem. Um, but I think the question is, is your proposed solution a good thing or not? Let, let, let me just. Well, you know, in my solution, you know, it's a temporary. It's a temporary solution. Until and when? Obviously, well, till we get our hands around the problem. We have a real problem. Mr. Zogby, his Muslim friends tell him it's it's good that he's bringing up this debate and that his solution is would be temporary. Um, I take with a grain of salt most of what Donald Trump says because, frankly. Um, Way too many times um, what he says is what he fabricates in his own mind. There's very little connection between assertions he makes and, and reality. I mean, if I were to say to Donald Trump, um, your hair uh, looks really weird, um, he would say, oh, people commented on my hair today. Um, he, he hears what he wants to hear. I do not believe that very elevated leadership in the region um, is supportive of what he's saying. I've been to the Middle East very recently. I've spoken with people. Major business partners of, of his are suspending their relationship and canceling contracts. Uh, I do not think this is the case at all. M maybe somebody said, it's really good that you're attacking radical Islam, but you've really gone overboard and you've made some crazy assertions. He only hears the first part that he wants to hear. He does not have support. John, Jacksonville, Florida, Republican. Hi, John. Good morning. How y'all doing? Doing just fine. Your question or comment here from Mr. Zogby. Okay. Back uh, from 1995 to about 2000, there was a man and woman that I believe was from Saudi Arabia that uh, was talking about the fitna process on the different talk shows. And I want to know if Mr. Zogby is uh, familiar with the fitna process, and I believe they spell it F-I-T-N-A, 
and this was a process where uh, elite Muslims, doctors, professors, so and so would would go out around the world and get into the elite positions in communities uh, in order to take over uh, the world, especially in America and the West. And I was wondering if he is familiar with this process. Well, I am familiar with the concept, but that is not a process that exists, nor uh, I don't know the couple you're talking about, but um, it's simply not a, a, a reality. There is no um, Islamic intent to take over the world. Um, it is a, a religion like uh, Christianity that is a religion based on conversion. I mean, of course, they believe that their faith is true, and Christians believe their faith is true, and we have missionaries who, who attempt and, and work hard to convert people. Um, but as the Quran says, there is, uh, there is no compulsion in religion. Um, and uh, and the, the idea that, uh, that, uh, that you would have a sort of a secret, tricky society, sort of like the, the, the Mason, anti-Mason movements that, are, that existed, the scare stuff, trying to take over by, uh, by sleight of hand or by uh, devilish uh, tactics. Uh, it, it's, it's part of the Islamophobia, it's part of the scare tactic uh, to fear Muslims in general. So no, uh, look, there are Muslim doctors here who are saving lives every day uh, and they're in our hospitals and thank God that they're there because they're, they're helping. My, my wife's pulmonologist is, a, is a, just a remarkable man. Um, Thank God he's, uh, he's doing what he's doing. The fact is, is that we, we, you know, we owe a debt to these folks who are part of our society, who are part of our world. I mean, just as we have uh, other ethnic and, and, and religious groups who came to America and were rejected when they came, we rejected Jews, we rejected Italians, we rejected uh, the Irish, et cetera. Uh, where would America be without them today? And and someday we'll say, thank God we had uh, we had Arabs and Muslims come to America. Where would we be? And even now we could say, where would we be without Danny Thomas and the St. Jude's Hospital? Um, and yet, back when my father was coming, Danny and and my dad's generation, uh, they came from what was called Syria, and we had a Syrian Exclusion Act that was passed by a Senator David Reed from Pennsylvania who said we don't need any more Syrian trash in America. And so Syrians were excluded for three decades. Thank God Danny Thomas came before then because we have children being saved every single day from leukemia because of the work of Danny Thomas and because of the work of the allied Syrian Lebanese uh, uh, associated charities, ALSAC, that's how it began, that raised the money to build St. Jude's Hospital. So, you know, let's get real here. Uh, this is America. It is not a place where we're afraid of welcoming new people. It's a place where we embrace new people because they make us better. Mustafa is in Smyrna, Georgia, a Muslim American. You're on the air. Yes, uh, thank you for taking my call. Uh, I want to come on uh, three common. Number one, I support Donald Trump in his plan is not completely, but because the ISIS strategy, like the idea come from, they call Wahhabi in Saudi Arabia. And that's what they hiding behind. They don't believe in Muslim Sunni. They don't believe in Muslim Shia. They believe in jihad. And that's what the extremists become all the support from Saudi Arabia and their regime. So if you attack the Wahhabi, stop every Wahhabi to come to America. Ask him, where are you from? He says, so Saudi, Sunni, are you believe in Wahhabi? He said, yeah, I was, I was stopping. If I, uh, that's number one. Number two, uh, about uh, stop Muslim American uh, from uh, coming here, or Arab American or whatever, Muslim come to this country, I think you need to stop it for a minute and figure a way who you're going to bring and who you're not going to bring. Okay, Mustafa, because, where are you from? I'm from Sudan. Okay. Mr. Zogby. Uh, listen, uh, thank God that uh, f folks in, in, in the government uh, don't have that approach. Um, and I think Donald Trump is wrong for, for promoting it. Let me be clear. What we're talking about, this crisis was started as a, as a concept when President Obama announced we were going to be taking 10,000 Syrian refugees. Uh, Donald Trump inflated it to 200,000. Others went 250,000. I don't know where they dreamed up these numbers. The president said 
10,000 a year. That's actually too little. Uh, most of the, the immigrant and resettlement and refugee resettlement groups want us to do 65, 70,000. Martin O'Malley, presidential candidate, has said that many. Uh, Hillary Clinton has said the same. Um, the refugee process is so totally different than the immigration process that it really needs to be understood. If you look on our uh, Twitter feed at the Arab American Institute or if you look at the government website and look at the vetting process, the level of screening that you have to go through, uh, the scare that we're going to be flooded by Syrian refugees who are ISIS. This is not Europe where people just walk across a border and come into your country. Uh, you have to get on a plane and before you get on a plane, you spend two years of being vetted in multiple levels of, of investigation that make it pretty clear who we're getting and who we're not getting. And so the issue is there's nothing to be afraid of here. Mr. Zabi, can I ask Mark yeah. Stone's question, though, yeah. while you're talking? If the Saudis aren't taking these refugees in because they view them as security risks, why on earth should we? That's not the case at all. Um, in fact, uh, the Saudis do have um, a, a couple hundred thousand uh, Syrians who've come into the country, and the United Arab Emirates has about 130,000. Lebanon has 1.3 or 4 million. Jordan has over a million. Uh, Arabs are doing a lot. E Egypt has a uh, uh, 100,000 or more Syrians in the country. I mean, everyone in the region is helping. The fact is, is that a lot of these refugees uh, don't want to go to the Gulf. They want to go to Europe and they want to come to America. And so the United Nations uh, High Commission has actually logged those who have applied to come to America. They go through a vetting process. They s sort out those who they think would be better suited to America than elsewhere. The English language capacity, they have family ties, uh, et cetera. And they then give us the list and we then go through a separate vetting process here. So to say Arabs aren't doing it is wrong. Uh, actually, it's the choice of the refugee. They'd prefer to go this way than that way. But some refugees would prefer to stay in the Arab world. And that's where they're going. You talked about a poll that's coming out later yeah. this week. Who do sure. you poll? How do you do your poll? And let me show our viewers one of the questions. Yeah, sure. Uh, this is about U.S. policy on Syrian refugees. 40% of those that you polled says do not accept in, yeah. them in the United States. 30% said resettle 10,000 after the vetting that you were just talking yeah. about. 7% said resettle only Christian refugees. Yeah, the poll is uh, done by Zogby Analytics, um, um, my nephew and my brother's company in upstate New York. Um, and this was an online survey. Uh, and uh, um, the, 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 the numbers here are interesting because of the demographic split between Democrats and Republicans, uh, with Republicans overwhelmingly opposed and Democrats favoring uh, the president's proposal. Uh, but you also have an internal split, not just the partisan split, but the demographic split with, with older Americans, uh, less educated Americans, uh, white Americans having one view um, and minorities and uh, uh, younger people and educated, college educated people having the view that becomes what is the more liberal view of, of supporting uh, bringing refugees in. And on almost every issue we get that, those, that, that, that huge divide uh, coming out. Another uh, question that they asked is your view of Muslim Americans. 33% said they have a favorable view while 37% said unfavorable. Yeah, and that number has been trending downward in the last couple of years, largely because of the, 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 uh, the, the, the media. Look, uh, San Bernardino happened. It was a horrific, horrific uh, massacre. The backlash that occurred against Muslims afterwards was absolutely unconscionable. The rhetoric was unconscionable. The way the media focused on it was unconscionable. After the shootings in Colorado, we did not go after anti-abortion uh, advocates in the same way, where every one of them was targeted as somehow a danger to the country. After the massacre in Charleston, uh, uh, South Carolina, we did not go after everybody with a Confederate flag on their car and assume that they were going to be murderers. We did the same, with, we did that on the other hand with Muslims. And so by focusing on one kind of domestic terror and not focusing on other kind, you would think that uh, Muslim terror, quote unquote, is the only problem facing America, whereas in fact mass shootings are happening every day and acts of terror are happening more frequently than we think, but we don't focus on those ones, we only focus on the ones that, that occur when a Muslim does it. 
um, a cartoon I saw in the paper um, that was um, I, I, tragic. It was the, after the Colorado shooting, and it was a husband and wife uh, watching TV, um, and the one guy on TV is saying, don't panic anybody, don't panic. It wasn't a Muslim who did it. Um, and, and yet that's the attitude that unfortunately exists, is that if the, if, the, if the terrorist is not a Muslim, we don't worry about it. We just sort of let it happen. But if the terrorist is a Muslim, then it becomes a much different issue and we want to ban people from coming in the country and we want to do things to deface mosques and go after uh, American Muslims. That attitude there that you have that was reflected on the screen, again, is 60% Republicans saying, uh, that they had an unfavorable view of Muslims, whereas almost 50% of, uh, of Democrats had a favorable view. So again, almost a, like the gay marriage uh, split that we had 15 years ago. And we were just showing overall the, the uh, percentage to right. that question. We'll go to Nathan in Bakerstown, Pennsylvania, Democrat. Hi, Nathan. Hi. I wanted to say that the first step to fight terrorism is to be honest and truthful. And if our government officials be honest and truthful about issues, then we're going to move forward in this fight. And so far, I haven't seen any honesty among them about terrorism, about Muslims, about the Muslim world. But, you know, where I did have some truth was in the letter that Ayatollah Khamenei, the Iranian leader, sent to Western youngsters, okay, he said that our double standards in the West, as long as we say that there are good terrorists and bad terrorists, and as long as our interests are more valuable than human interests and moral values, then we can go to look for the roots of violence anywhere else. I mean, that's the truth, okay? As long as we say we can go there, we can fund terrorists and Ms. Clinton and lots of our politicians admitted that they did this. I mean, Taliban, Al-Qaeda, and ISIS now, they're funded by us. Okay, so. let's take that point. Mr. Zagby. Well, look, we, we, there's a problem. Um, I'm not taking my, my cues from the, from the Ayatollah. But, uh, but there, is, uh, there is a concern that exists, certainly. Um, the, the Mujahideen in, in Afghanistan, uh, we encouraged and supported the, the Mujahideen uh, as the way uh, to defeat the Soviet occupation. Um, and after the Soviets left, we abandoned the country. Uh, the Mujahideen broke up into, into um, several competing groups, and the Taliban came in, and when the Taliban uh, moved in, these were young folks from the, they were students um, who had grown up in the madrasas, they said, we have to unify the country and stop all of the civil war of all these different armed groups competing with each other. We actually looked at that as a initially positive sign. We thought, these guys might be a little extremist, but they're going to stop all of the internal killing in the country. And so we, we gave it a wink and a nod. Um, so th there could be some support for saying that, yeah, we encouraged it. We certainly encouraged the Mujahideen. And in Iraq, look, if George Bush had not done this foolish invasion of Iraq in 2003, a lot of what we're dealing with in the region right now would not be occurring. And America's prestige in the region would be higher. And America's ability to deal with these problems. Our military is overstretched. Our prestige is too low. Um, and we learned from trying to remake both Afghanistan and Iraq that America's capacity uh, to make this kind of change was not capable. So that when I hear you know, politicians say, we ought to bomb them back to the Stone Age or level the country or we ought to do this or do that, they're not thinking straight. It sounds great as a one-liner that gets cheers from people but they don't think what it means concretely and would it solve a problem or would it, as I believe, exacerbate the problem and produce a situation where at the end of the day we have many more extremists than we have right now. Do you think that's a problem that Russia is presenting for itself? Front page of the Washington yeah. Post, Russian airstrikes in Syria are halting aid. Yeah. They're bombing the supply routes for humanitarian aid from Turkey into Syria. Hospitals and health facilities have been struck, reducing the yeah. availability of medical care for those injured at the bombings. According to the UN, at least 20 medical facilities have been hit nationwide in Syria since Russia launched its air war on September 30th. Russia's digging a hole for itself in Syria like it did in Afghanistan. It's a, it's a, there is no military solution to this conflict. Um, no one seems to get it yet. Uh, there has to be a political solution. There has to be a political compromise. 
uh, people have to stop funding the different competing groups and there has to be a political resolution that will ultimately create internal unity that can then deal with the ISIS threat. What does a dip diplomatic solution look like when it comes to Bashar al-Assad? Pretty much what was talked about in Geneva 1, Geneva 2. I mean, uh, setting a precondition that he must go before you start negotiations is a non-starter for negotiations. But having Bashar al-Assad be head of Syria forever is also a non-starter to negotiations. A transitional period that creates national unity and moves forward to a transition away from his leadership is absolutely, uh, absolutely critical, but it can't be done in one fell swoop. Eric in California, Independent. Yeah, hi. I, uh, I'd just like to say as far as uh, people reacting as to the, uh, the California event, uh, the, the reason is 9-11 was done by Muslim terrorists. I mean, there's been terrorism domestically ever since people have been going off the post office and going postal. But... Uh, the reason people are freaked is because of 9-11. Uh, okay, can you respond to that, Mr. There's, Zaki? There's no question that 9-11 uh, created a, a, a fear, a justifiable fear, uh, about domestic terrorism. But you're absolutely right at the same time that there's uh, domestic terrorism uh, that comes in many stripes. And law enforcement, um, in survey after survey, says that their biggest concern, their biggest fear, is with anti-government groups uh, from the fringe uh, on the right wing. Um, we have to have a holistic approach to this and deal with it uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a way that um, displays our, um, our, our sense of security and stability and not in a way that has us wildly striking out and saying uh, outrageous things as some of the candidates have done. Because as I said, when you do that, you exacerbate the problem. You create not only broader fear, a backlash uh, among some, but you also create insecurity um, that results in uh, young Muslim kids feeling that they don't belong, aren't wanted here, uh, which ultimately can become uh, a larger problem for America to have to deal with. Uh, we cannot end up alienating a generation of young people um, who will ultimately become American, make a contribution to our country. We do not want to turn them away, which is what unfortunately uh, is being done, making their lives really difficult. I have young kids who work for me um, who are Muslim. Uh, sometimes the parents are afraid to let them come out of the house um, because they're afraid of the backlash. Uh, kids getting death threats. 16-year-old kids should not get uh, messages on their phone threatening their lives because of their religion. That's not America. That's not who we ought to be. And that ultimately is a, is a, a um, I think, a, it, it's just wrong. It's just wrong. It shouldn't happen. Front page of the New York Times, reporter Kirk Semple de delves into yeah. this yeah. with the headline, Muslim youths in the United States feel strain of suspicion. Mark Fortley, New Jersey, a Republican. Good morning, Mark. Good morning. Um, Listen, Mr. Zogby, I, I, all I hear from you is the blame America first uh, crowd. You know, Europe and America have opened their doors to uh, from immigrants from all over the world, and we, we've we become embroiled in this, this, this cauldron that's the Middle East, that competing cultures and religious, uh, you know, shades of, of religious intensity. And all I hear from you is blame us because we're not holding hands and try. You know, you want us to hold your hand, but then when we hold your hand and try to be the adult, you're telling us we're being overly, uh, you know, uh, parental. And I don't hear you blaming the the Arabs themselves. You know, the Arab cultures are at war with each other constantly over minutia. I mean, it's ridiculous. You okay. Know, so, so to your point, Mark, because here's a Twitter from a tweet from Maria who says this, are you guys still pretending Turkey doesn't support ISIL, Daesh, Erdogan? She, she puts hashtag Erdogan, oil, Turkey out of NATO. Look, um, uh, certainly Turkey um, has done more than a wink and a nod. The left a, a porous border that um, uh, Jabhat Nusra and other groups, uh, Harar, Sham, Jaish, uh, look, there's a number of these groups all of which have gotten support either direct or indirect from Turkey. Um, and Turkey has its own interests in Syria. I mean, they have an interest in uh, 
um, blocking Kurdish independence. They have some territory in Syria that they want for themselves. Um, and uh, they have uh, an ethnic uh, community in Turkey that they feel, in, in Syria, that they feel protective of. Um, there's no question about that. Um, and Arabs have made some horrible blunders in, in Turkey as, as in, and Syria as well. Um, and Iran is involved in, look, the region is involved. This is a conflict in Syria that has become a regional playground of competing interests. A proxy war? A proxy war that started as one thing and has now become a regional proxy war. The issue is that if, if, if America were to play the proper role and if Russia were to play its proper role, it would be playing the role of convening all of these parties, which is what Senator, Secretary Kerry is doing right now in an effort to come up with a negotiated settlement. That's the only way forward. And those negotiations continue this week with a meeting in New York where the Secretary of State wants Russia to convince a, a representative, Bashar al-Assad, yeah. to attend that meeting. Let me go to Muriel in Brock, Brooksville, Florida, a Democrat. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, I, I would like to ask if what he would do, first of all, I don't want the answer now, but what I want to know is all these millions of people that are coming all over the other countries, which we have to take a chance and take an in, uh, and why couldn't they fight for their own country? Why didn't they send their, their wives and their children and elderly people? Because some of them died on the way. Why don't they? Who is going to take us in if if the, the, everybody else takes over America? Nobody. We're going to have to fight for our own country. All right, Muriel, I'll leave it there. Mr. Zogby. I'd like to know where, where Muriel comes from, um, what, what part of the world, because, look, the fact is, all of us uh, who are here came from somewhere, and oftentimes fleeing the same kind of persecution, the same kind of, of, of hardship, and making that kind of difficult choice. I know my, 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 my dad's story um, uh, was a harrowing one for his family uh, during World War I, fleeing first from the Ottomans and then leaving the country in, in desperation to come what uh, to, was to America? What was Syria? What well, was Lebanon? Lebanon. They're, they're okay. from Lebanon, but it was called Syria at the okay. time. Um, and I hear the stories from Eastern Europeans uh, during the Cold War period. I hear the same story from uh, the Irish during the famine, when one third of the country died of starvation, one third of the country fled uh, to come to America, and one third was left. I mean, everyone has this same story. It's no different today. And interestingly enough, when each one of those groups came. They experienced the same thing. The Ukrainians, we were told, they were going to destroy our country. The Jews were going to be subversive uh, Bolsheviks. The Italians were anarchists uh, and criminals, etc. Every group was greeted with the same thing. And then, after they come here, they want to close the door and say that the people coming next are a threat. That's not our story. That's not who we are. And so, look. Um, there are not millions coming to America. There are millions fleeing their country. President wants to take in 10,000. That's it. 10,000 a year that will be vetted, that will take two to three years to go through the vetting process. I think that's too onerous. But the fact is, is that he's trying his best to be as clear as he can about the process so that people don't get nervous. And yet, Donald Trump says 200,000. Somebody else says 250,000. Muriel says millions coming and it's not going to be our country anymore. The same kind of thing was said back after World War I when people were coming and there were, the nativist movement said, it's not our country anymore. And so we, we passed all kinds of exclusion acts to keep out all di different kinds of people. The fact is, is that look at our history, look at how we've overcome our history, and look at where we are today. Where would we be without the immigrants who were denied uh, to come into our country a hundred years ago. Where would we be today without the Polish and the Italian and the Irish and the German, et cetera? Um, we wouldn't be America. And a century from now, we'll look back and we'll say, boy, thank God we let the Muslims in. Thank God we let the Syrians and the Iraqis in because they've made a real contribution to our country. I mean, give it a break, guys. Be confident in who you are. Be confident in what America is and be confident in what America will become when we stay true to our values. 
If you want to learn more about the Arab American Institute, you can go to their website. It is aaiusa.org. Mr. Zogby, thanks for the conversation this Thank morning. Thank you so much. We're going to take a short break when we come back. I'm the leading state sponsor of terrorism.